Sure, you will see that Lake Michigan is frozen. This doesn't happen very often, so you can sort of record that in your memories. Um, and this is an award session. And award sessions are always great fun because they recognize people who have changed the world of chemistry in which we live. Our contemporaries and our friends who have nevertheless changed the world of chemistry in which we live, and that's going to happen a couple of times today. Um, so there are two awardees. One is Joe Hupp, who has won the Riley Award. And uh, let's see if I can get this to work. That's what Chicago looks like when it's dark. Can we dim the lights a little bit? So Joe is my colleague, my friend, my teacher. We've written 11 papers together. Um, and I have to say I've learned a lot more from him than he's learned from me. What you see on the left is, is Joe of 10 years ago. What you see on the right is Joe of more or less the present. But there are all sorts of you know, important issues about this man that you need to know about. Firstly, he was born in Cuba, um, a different Cuba, but nevertheless a Cuba. Right? And he was an undergraduate at Houghton, and then graduate student at Michigan State, um, postdoc at the place where electrochemistry basically has its capital, and uh, joined Northwestern after that. Charlie Riley was at UNC and was a major force in electrochemistry. Um, died early, but left a, a, a huge influence, both through his own students and through other people who got to know him and learn the way that he looked at electrochemistry. It's an important award of the society, and uh, I'm delighted that one of my friends and colleagues has won it. Then a little, f just a couple things about Joe. Um, he's a man of many, many, many interests, capabilities. Uh, Team Hop, the Adrenaline Rush 5K race. There he is with other the members of Team Hop. Needless to say, he always beats the rest of the guys at no matter what he does. So. That's the group a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago. It's big, it's smart, it's wise. They do everything. Um, when I want to know something in chemistry, I've got George Schatz next to me and I've got Joe downstairs. That's a good situation. It turns out that um, he has other interests, and I hadn't known this, but this is on his website. and. Uh, Permitted means that that little fish that Keith is holding, that's called a permit. And if you catch one of those, you, you, you sort of live in a higher world, right? These people who have caught permits are like people who have run the four-minute mile. I mean, it's, it's really quite impressive. I notice that it's not Joe who caught the permit, but... Why is it still on his website? <laughs> you know what else is still on his website? That. And I don't know what... No, it's not on your website. It's not on your website. If, if I look you up... Right? If you put Joe Hupp images, this, among other things, shows up. And I think it's actually probably the right thing, because that guy on top, that's Joe, right? And he's, he's dealing with this wild world of the chemical sciences, which he's done for so long and done so well. So the president of the society is here to award the Riley Award to Joe. Thank you, Mark. I don't remember the uh, I don't remember the bull. This is Charles Riley. I um, I knew of Charles Riley. I, I I figured out about halfway through my undergraduate studies that uh, being an electrochemist was a was a higher calling than being an ordinary chemist. And uh, North Carolina was a place that I thought um, uh, very carefully about uh, uh, going to school there. Uh, it turns out North Carolina didn't think so carefully about me going to school there, so <clears throat> uh, didn't have an opportunity. Uh, 
and by the time I did get to North Carolina, where, where no applications as a student were involved, um, uh, Charles, uh, Charlie had passed away, but uh, I um, read one of the theses of his uh, very last students in, uh, in, in graduate school, it was um, uh, Rick Van Dyne's uh, thesis. I didn't realize that a few years later I'd be um, Rick's um, a colleague at Northwestern, but uh, I, I believe that um, um, there are two, maybe three, of uh, Charlie's students who uh, have received uh, the award, uh, most recently Deborah. Let me turn to this. So wh what's occupied uh, my attention scientifically for um, a good part of the time uh, that I've spent at Northwestern, starting in North Carolina, uh, are uh, photoelectrochemical energy conversion problems, mostly from a fundamental perspective. And what I want to tell you about today is uh, not an overview, just a, uh, a, a snapshot, okay, a string of snapshots, uh, an album of some recent work uh, where the focus is on catalysis. I need to acknowledge these folks, uh, and you'll see um, their names on many slides. Uh, let me draw your attention to Professor Farha, who's in the uh, in the back. His name is not on any of the slides because I didn't want to put it on every slide. Uh, but uh, Omar has uh, published uh, over a hundred papers uh, with me over the last six or seven years and uh, his fingerprints are all over uh, all of the work you're going to see. Uh, these folks uh, all have been involved in one way or another uh, with the work I'm going to describe. So here's the idea. How about this? Mercedes-Benz, uh, an electric powered vehicle. We have electric powered vehicles, so what's special about this? Mercedes-Benz says, let's power it with hydrogen. And we'll <clears throat> we, um, uh, we see some you know, rather striking statistics, 137 miles per hour, zero to 60 in under five seconds. And uh, 100 uh, kilometer range on eight tenths of a kilogram of hydrogen, 621 miles on a full tank. So Mercedes-Benz thinks they know how, they know how to, they're going to do this. They haven't done it yet. Um, Toyota, on the other hand, um, has done this, and they're going to introduce in 2015 in California a car powered by hydrogen. So why hydrogen? As a fuel, the gravimetric energy density is gigantic. Bonds between hydrogen atoms aren't very strong, but, but hydrogen weighs almost nothing. It's, we can't... Uh, can't envision a lighter molecule. If we burned it, which we as electrochemists know would be a bad idea, but if we burned it, the combustion product of water, if we can't wean ourselves from hydrocarbons, um, Fischer tropes will um, bring us um, hydrocarbons um, uh, using hydrogen and CO. Uh, if we want to eat for the rest of our lives, then uh, we need hydrogen to combine with nitrogen to make ammonia. Uh, otherwise, our uh, capacity on the Earth is only about 2 billion people instead of 7 billion people. The hydrogen is pretty important, uh, but in a, a vehicle context, there's another point that uh, we need to focus on, and that is burning hydrogen um, is a bad idea, but consuming it, consuming it in electrochemical half reactions turns out to be a pretty good idea. So one of the things you realize when you start to um, investigate the case for hydrogen-powered vehicles is hydrogen only has to be a third as good as gasoline. Only has to be a third as good uh, in, order to, uh, in order to be its equal because uh, we, we have difficulty using hydrocarbons in fuel cells, so we're, as a practical matter, we're really stuck with um, internal combustion. And tank to wheel, 20% is about the best we can do. Fuel cells being um, isothermal devices, not doing pressure volume work, we can, we can claim about 60% in a, in a well-engineered electric vehicle. This is about how good a Tesla does. So where do, where do things stand? Tesla doesn't run on hydrogen. It's an electric vehicle, but it runs on batteries. And uh, there are three challenges. You have to make the hydrogen, and we can do that in a, in a, in a temporary way by uh, steam reforming uh, methane, but eventually um, eventually we're going to run out. And if we do it in that way, it's still probably green because the greenhouse gases we make in steam reforming, we can capture at one site and then we can distribute the exhaust everywhere with water. We need 
good ways to store and release it. Uh, and this is where, um, if you read the bottom of the Mercedes-Benz slide, that, that was their, their, their big idea. If they had a material of 5,000 square meters per gram, um, they could make this work. And they think that they think they can find such a material. Um, Toyota went with the idea of tanks that uh, are running at a few hundred atmospheres of, uh, of pressure of hydrogen and no storage material. And, and we'll see, there, there'll be some um, reluctance, but none of us think about that we're really driving Molotov cocktails uh, around uh, with four wheels, so maybe it's not as scary, um, hydrogen's not as scary as it should be, or maybe gasoline engines aren't as scary as they should be, in any case. It's interesting that the one thing that's worked out is how to use it. Fuel cell technology is pretty darn impressive, but how to make it in a renewable way and how to store and release it, certainly conceptually, we've known for a long time how to do that. But as a practical matter, um, we'd want to use we'd want to use external energy. We want to use sunlight, something else uh, that's that's arriving from outside the planet. And I show you here the half reactions, uh, along with a, a figure stolen from uh, from some slides, Tom. Hammond gave me to teach from a long time ago. Um, and so you can see the idea. Let's carry out electrolysis and let's drive the electrolysis uh, with photons. And um, if, we, if we think about that, is it possible? Well, it is, and it was, was demonstrated many years ago in this um, um, sort of tutorial uh, type article that Al Bard uh, published not too long ago. Um, he draws attention to the water splitting problem. He shows very old experiment. It's not uh, the earliest one, but it shows um, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen at a strontium titanate electrode, and um, it, it works. Um, <coughs> the problem is that we only can use UV photons with strontium titanate because very large band gap material and things with smaller band gap don't work very well. So if you think about it, that's, that's a little bit odd because we really, um, we really only need one and a quarter volts thermodynamically to split the water. We need it four times because we need four, uh, four point nine, almost five EVs of, 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 um, uh, of free energy in order to drive the reaction. But we can break it up into increments, and you can see the dotted lines are the thermodynamic potentials. And look at just the hydrogen uh, formation from protons. 2.2 volts straight up if we, uh, thank you, 2.2 volts straight up if we, uh, if we want to go through a hydrogen atom intermediate. And so this draws uh, our attention immediately to um, the challenge that we don't want to span the difference between here and here. We want to span the difference between here and here. So this turns into a, a problem where we need good electrocatalysts. Now, we have, we have efficient electrocatalysts, but if we take good to also mean there would be enough to switch all vehicles to hydrogen, and there would, and it would be inexpensive, uh, and it would, uh, and they would last well, and so on. Well, we don't really have a, we don't really have good electrocatalysts across the board yet. Uh, so one way to think about this is to turn to Mother Nature and ask, how how does she do this? And uh, I show you here a picture of uh, the active site of hydrogenase. There, uh, some iron centers and um, there's some sulfur atoms and uh, what we realize pretty quickly is these are clusters. If we look at um, how oxygen's are made it, it, with the um, with the oxygen uh, evolving complex in photosystem two, the guts of it are in the right hand side where you can see that there are three manganese in a cubane along with a calcium and then oxygen's occupying the, the other uh, corners of the cubane and, and then a manganese uh, parked outside. And, and this works pretty darn well. So it seems that clusters could be, they may, maybe they're the way to go, maybe they aren't, but certainly there's, there has to be some interesting science there. So if we want to use this inspiration, we've got to create open sites, but um, that becomes a challenge experimentally. Uh, if we create open sites, we tend to find that clusters aggregate. If clusters aggregate, um, we can't use them. If we stabilize them with uh, ligands on the surface, we, we can't, um, we can't um, uh, end up addressing uh, the active site. So there's a, there's a challenge. Nature gets around this with uh, uh, polypeptide um, uh, surroundings and so forth. 
Uh, but um, we need to find a way to do that otherwise. There's, a, uh, there's an interesting, I think a very interesting idea um, uh, to be explored at the cluster level. It has to do with compositions. The phase diagrams for clusters, um, maybe not even well defined for cluster, but uh, in any case, something like a composition that is um, that's half uh, half iron and half nickel would would likely be a terrific um, oxygen evolution electrocatalyst. What happens if we try to make it? Phase segregates into nickel uh, oxide and um, uh, nickel pyrite and so on. We can't we can't get more than four or five percent nickel into the iron. With clusters, so many atoms on the uh, outside, strain energies are not nearly as important. Uh, and we should be able to get the compositions that theory tells us uh, would be interesting. So how to do this? I show you on the left, um, atomic layer deposition has been a tool uh, that we have used in the laboratory for, um, I guess, about, about seven years. Uh, we have three commercial instruments now, and so why do we like this? It's a terrific way to make electrode materials. And more recently, we've discovered it's a nice way to make um, catalysts. What I show you here is the is the synthesis of of a tunneling barrier layer. This is something that um, turns out to be useful in a disensitized solar cell uh, to keep electrons from going backwards. And here's a surface presenting hydroxyls in the dye cell. This is titania. Uh, aluminum uh, trimethyl aluminum reacts, uh, removes the protons, methanes leave and we end up with a surface that's coated with lots of alumina. The second full cycle and we deposit the second layer. So if you want a layer that's six angstroms thick but nine would be too thick and three would be not thick enough, this turns out to be a great way to do things. It's conformal, um, self-limiting, uh, and, um, and extraordinarily reproducible since all, uh, all, all uh, keyboard driven chemistry in the end once you puzzle it out. As you might guess, um, it's it's jumped across the, um, the chasm, and it is, um, it's indeed in use uh, industrially, mostly uh, for uh, semiconductors, for, um, in particular for making very thin, um, very, very thin dielectric coatings. Uh, how about this? What about molecules? If we could, if we do this, uh, we could make a, a, a coating of some metal oxide, and here's alumina, but how about this? Let's place a hydroxyl um, in the middle of an island and the, um, the reactant, uh, the trimethyl aluminum, is poised to react quickly, but only if it finds the hydroxyl. There are hydroxyls here, but once this is on the surface, these serve to anchor uh, the molecule onto the surface. So we have uh, once every 20 angstroms or so, hydroxyl, and we'll dose this. This is work uh, of Jason Avila and, uh, or Avila and my uh, uh, former student and scientist at Argonne, Alex Martinson. Uh, Jason installed um, a metal with a hydroxyl, and then he cycled and cycled and cycled, uh, and he progressively grew clusters larger and larger and larger. What's attractive about this is that every cluster is the same size. And he, uh, as I'll show you, he knows uh, what the size of the cluster is uh, because um, he uh, he weighs uh, the experiment. He cares that carries this out with um, quartz crystal microbalance. Uh, now is the part where I'll walk you through the equation, and I'm not going to walk you through the equation. This, um, what you can see is here. There's a hook. Um, this is curved, and then there's a straight line. This is the mass gained as we're dosing by ALD. This is the number of cycles. This curvature is where we're getting hemispherical growth, and so it's going up exponentially. The sixth cycle's got a lot more than the fifth cycle. But eventually, the hemispheres bump into each other, and now we have um, a corrugated 2D surface. And here's what happens experimentally. You can see it takes 25 cycles. In this case, a radius of convergence pops up that is, um, that is experimentally pretty darn close to, to what we expect. Um, if we carry out the same experiment without the hot spot, so we'll place zinc here rather than uh, aluminum or, or tin or manganese, so no hydroxyls. Here's what we get. These are, this is the how much grows, and you can see there's a detectable amount of, 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 of deposition of um, manganese um, hydroxide, but just barely detectable after, um, after scores of cycles. So you really have to uh, underscore that the, the reactivity is there um, on the hot spot, and we nucleate from there. We haven't looked at these yet for catalytic activity. But here's a similar experiment with nickel. Um, 
we have looked at these um, for catalytic uh, activity, uh, and I'll show you a few experiments. So these are plots of current density versus uh, potential, differing numbers of ALD cycles. This is work of uh, mainly uh, Dongwoo Kim. And uh, what we see is, well, sort of what we expect. The more nickel we have, uh, the, the, um, the smaller the overpotentials um, and, and the better the catalysis. However, if we normalize this, then we, uh, then we see that um, probably the, the most interesting cluster is, uh, uh, is this at 10 cycles. It's, it's got the most bang for the buck if we look at current um, output per nanogram of stuff. So this is a, a 2D surface with uh, either a 3 cycle, 5 cycle, 10 or 20 cycle uh, cluster um, sitting on um, an array of, of, of porphyrins. Now where are the porphyrins? At this stage, Dong Wook is, uh, the porphyrins' worst nightmare has happened. He subjected them to um, um, exposure to, to, to ozone with heating um, for, for about three hours. So the, uh, the porphyrins died a quick death, and these are the naked clusters. Look at these uh, as an electrochemist would and uh, get toffle plots if we look at uh, overpotential versus log of rate or current. And it looks like, um, looks like a two electron are transferred reversibly uh, before the rate determining step. Kinetic overpotential. It's not, it's not where we want to be. We want to be, really would like to be at about half that, but at least below 400 millivolts. Now, to me, this seems pretty exciting. Uh, not very many atoms, and we're getting reasonable, uh, reasonable amounts of current. Uh, if we could introduce many more atoms, we'd be better off. Uh, but to introduce many more atoms, we uh, will get larger clusters. So if we go from 2D to 3D, so we'll take the porphyrin array that's flat, build it as a 3D structure, some metal organic framework, boost the number of sites. So we're the overall hypothesis then, and this is the work of mainly Joe Mondlock, is that we can that we can grow MOFs inside of metal organic frameworks, and I'll call them MOFs the rest of the way, that we can carry out atomic layer deposition. And so we're now we're not really building layers. We're nucleating clusters, um, and, and these are not the proportion. The walls are really about this long compared to the size of the trimethyl aluminum, but that's, um, that's the idea. So it turns out this doesn't really work, and it was a, 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 a puzzle until we thought we had things uh, correct with these requirements of good stability, um, exposure to steam at 150 degrees, exposure to HCl at 150, um, subsequent um, use in strong base and so on. But this issue, permanent uh, mesoporosity, and I uh, finally looked at some work from my sometime collaborator at Argonne National Lab, Jeff Elam, and what Jeff showed was um, if you if you forget chemistry and just look at just look at the physics of moving th the things through little channels, how long it takes a little thing uh, to move through a channel goes as the square of the diameter of the channel. So <coughs> most of the MOFs we had looked at were five or six angstrom pores. Those seemed plenty big enough for everything else we'd looked at. So our challenge was to um, to get the diffusion time way way down. We're up here in all the experiments we tried, and we want to bring it way down to here. And uh, to do this, um, with some guidance from uh, Professor Farha, um, uh, Wojtek Buri, uh, a visitor from Poland, assembled this MOF. Uh, and the, the salient parts are this. The width of this is 31 angstroms. Uh, it's cleaned up by heating for 24 hours at close to boiling in half molar HCl. Uh, so it's, it, it, it passes the test as a robust material, at least on the hydrogen side. And on the exterior are 16 hydroxyls. The core is zirconium, and that's why it's so robust. Zirconium oxide is uh, used as cladding in um, uh, extremely hostile corrosive conditions. Hydroxyl ligands could react. Uh, here's the material, and you can just see a slice of it that there are channels um, large channels that uh, run through the depth and then um, small channels through which uh, things like hydrogen can, can escape from the side. Okay, so <coughs> I'll show you a cartoon now that Joe put together. The trimethyl aluminum grabs hydrogen atom, a proton, and the aluminum is now 
anchored to oxygen. And then this is it. The next trimethyl aluminum that enters can't react with this. It can react with these, but it can't react with this. Until we dose with water and remove these um, CH3 uh, anions with a proton and, and leave behind the other half of water, hydroxide. And then we're set up to grow again. But notice we deposit on one hydroxide, and then in the next step, we're presenting two hydroxides. So we get a geometric growth of the cluster. So here's some examples of methylation. Um, there's 16 hydroxyls. They're not all accessible um, to, the, to the precursor molecules. Uh, eight of them are accessible uh, to aluminum and four uh, to zinc. These experiments, these are powder x-ray diffraction experiments, and they just show that the material, despite the fact that it's a crystal that's mostly made of hydrocarbon, it doesn't uh, break down uh, in being dosed at uh, fairly high temperatures with, um, uh, with highly reactive um, organometallics. And you see some others here that um, Keith has looked at, and some of the metals are starting to look more interesting, like manganese and cobalt. The ALD periodic table of the elements, um, shown here in northwestern purple. Um, I've forgotten where Keith borrowed this from, maybe from, from Argon. Or, uh, I'm sorry, where Joe uh, M. Uh, borrowed this from. But you uh, see everything in purple is, is uh, an example. Uh, there's at least one example of a peer-reviewed paper demonstrating um, that atomic layer deposition can be used to form materials from those. Um, this is um, Joe Mondlach's um, um, ALD in MOFS table, and he's, um, I don't think he's, he's failed uh, with anything yet, but he's only had time to look at about um, um, not quite a dozen uh, elements, and he's had uh, good luck with this. Okay, so some of his initial results, we found that uh, if we cement the linkers between the organic and the inorganic parts, we can, we can um, confront these materials with extraordinarily basic uh, conditions and, and they, won't, uh, they won't degrade. Something that we had learned from um, stabilizing um, dyes on solar cells. Uh, if, we, um, if we introduce zinc on top of zirconium, it turns out that uh, these can degrade uh, phosphoesters by hydrolysis and they can degrade them rapidly. In the best case is about two minutes. Um, I won't go into this, but why that's important um, hopefully it'll never be important to us, but why it's important uh, in places like Syria uh, is that um, phosphoesters are, um, are nerve agents, uh, G agents, and um, the um, time uh, which you can survive after exposure to one of these is about, um, well, it's less than, uh, it's on the order of 10 minutes before you suffer brain damage because it uh, plugs up uh, Acetylcholinesterase stops it from working, and um, uh, muscles can no longer be driven and, uh, and suffocate uh, and die from lack of oxygen. This is a way of degrading these. Now, we're just starting to work with real nerve agents from a very long distance. They're all the way uh, in Maryland at, a, at a, um, an army uh, site that can deal with these uh, kinds of agents, but they look promising. Um, Aluminum inhibits the catalysis. Why do we want that? Well, we don't, but it, it, it teaches us something about how they work. Here's what we want, uh, oxygen evolution. So I'll show you here. Uh, on the left is a tiny vial, and um, the yellow particles are specks of NU1000 that have been um, four cobalts per zirconium node. and chemical oxidants been added, and you're going to have to squint at this, but um, you can see some things moving. That's the air bubbles pushing the particles, the MOF particles up. So this look pretty darn exciting. My uh, colleague Neil Kelleher let us borrow his, his, his mass spec on a cart, and uh, so we put the sniffer of the mass spec in here, and we found out, sure enough, that's oxygen that's streaming out of there. And then we we broke the bank and did the experiment again with O18, and we found out that it's all O16 coming out. And so um, it was exciting for a little while, but it turns out that what we were really carrying out was um, catalytic uh, decomposition of, of this um, oxidizing agent, oxone. What we really want to do is grow the material directly on an electrode. Uh, Chen Wei uh, Kung, uh, visitor, visiting chemical engineering student from National Taiwan University, did this. 
he puzzled out how to uh, grow these. Um, you can see little uh, rods in the top. The, the, we can see that these are crystalline. They cover more or less uniformly the surface. Um, Chen Wei zooms in on one of these and by electron diffraction sees that each one is a, a single crystal. And although they look solid, they're 85% hollow, all of these hexagonal channels. What happens when they're electrode supported? It turns out that they're 100% electroactive. The, um, the organics each contain a pyrene, and pyrene can be oxidized at far p positive potentials. And you can see it's oxidized reversibly here. Uh, and what's more, uh, we end up putting in one hole for, uh, for, for every pyrene. Um, <coughs> so we know that we can adjust, address this electrochemically. He, uh, Chen Wei did a little bit of work looking at how fast uh, these change color, and uh, from this uh, we can get some microscopic hole transfer rates of, well, you can see around 2 times 10 to the 4th per second. We might, we might be measuring the RC time constant of the cell, so this is a, this is a lower limit um, uh, hopping rate, uh, applying a, a, just a, a, a simple diffusion model and considering uh, that we can only measure the diffusion along the length of the rods uh, electrochemically. Um, what's useful about that is it's a large enough number that we ought to be able to drive a catalyst. And so we'll install cobalt um, at, at the nodes. Here's the pyrene site that had the electroactivity. Now we'll put the cobalt on the nodes and, and carry out the same thing with an array of these. And uh, this just shows that um, installing the cobalt, um, that happens uniformly and, and we retain crystallinity. So here are some plots of current density versus potential, and you can see now, um, well, cobalt 2-3 wave, cobalt 3-4 wave, and it takes off with uh, catalytic um, oxidation. The catalyst, uh, the MOF itself is not catalytic, but the, um, but the, the cobalt um, treated film is. Uh, what we find is that the, the mechanism involves hydroxide, and how do we know that? The current the limiting current is proportional to the amount of hydroxide that we have, and um, so we have to go higher in pH in order to drive this, um, um, uh, to um, <coughs> uh, under conditions where uh, we're not limited uh, by hydroxide delivery. So ultimately, we have to deliver 10 milliamps per centimeter square, and you can see that we're we're 20 fold short of that, uh, which means we uh, we really need to run these at higher pHs. Um, Okay, uh, and here are some experiments at higher pHs, and you can see they uh, work very well at pH 13. Um, all right, let me just wrap up by saying that <coughs> we also can deposit nickel sulfide inside of these. This is a brand new experiment from um, uh, Edon Hod. Uh, Edon came from um, um, Ari Zaban's. Uh, laboratory in uh, Israel, and uh, he's a real electrochemist, knows about electrodeposition, um, and uh, he found that he could electrodeposit nickel inside these scaffolds because they're hollow, and um, he sees uh, modest electrocatalytic uh, behavior. So where are we going after this? We have to integrate these photochemically. Now the good news is that these luminesce well. Um, pyrene has a high excited state. Um, I think we can drive these photochemically. And the bad news is we really only get the blue part of the spectrum. We need to uh, we need to explore lots of combinations, and the number of combinations we can imagine once we think about mixing metals and using either oxygen or uh, calcogens to balance the charge, and then factor in size. We, we quickly see that there's hundreds of thousands of possibilities, and we'll never be able to look at them. So we 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 need to look at these. Um, uh, with some computational guidance. Uh, and, and finally, hinted at in the upper right-hand corner, we, we've, we've mastered the task of, of, of uh, installing um, uh, oligopeptides and, and uh, organic acids and organic bases. And so I think we, um, uh, we will be able to explore how um, uh, tuning the environment uh, with guidance from uh, real enzymatic systems uh, can help us. Okay, I'm going to stop there and thank you very much for your attention.
it's not it's not true yet. I hope it'll be true. But here's where things stand: the 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 organic pieces they're plenty um, electroactive. We're we're accessing um, only a couple of percent of the cobalt. It's because we have only four cobalts per node. I I hope, but I don't know that this will be the case. That that once we have, you know, closer to a hundred cobalt atoms on each node, that uh, that will that will <coughs> there'll be a, a sufficient density of states to get reasonable um, transfer transport by tunneling. But we have not been able to do that yet. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, um, well, it, it, <coughs> it looks, um, it looks not much different, th well, in fact, there you can see it, there is, in red is, uh, bare fluorine dope tin oxide, and so it, the, 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 the FTO is what we, what we, we grew the, 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 the MOF scaffolds on and then introduced the, uh, nickel sulfide. If we if we leave the scaffold out, um, we see we see something roughly halfway in between those. It's 